my first time at Singularity, and I'm, I'm thrilled. And I was thinking about what to talk about. And I thought, how about something exponential? And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the latest work that I'm doing, trying to reduce the cost of something, not just by 10x, but by a thousandfold. And not just reduce the size of it by 10x, but a millionfold. And at the same time, increase its resolution by more than a millionfold. It seems impossible, but it's not. And it's, it's, it's why I quit my job at Facebook <laughs> to start this company, because I realized I could do it. And I didn't know if anyone else would see it. And so I urge all of you sitting in the audience, if you're seeing something and no one's getting it, don't give up. Find a way to get it done. And I started Open Water a year ago, and the results we have are, are fantastic. And so let me tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do. This is an MRI machine. It sees in very high resolution inside of your body. In fact, 22 years ago next month, I would have died if this machine hadn't found the brain tumor I had. It found it. I had the operation. They let me back into grad school. I finished my PhD in six months, got $4 million with two other students to start my first company. And I've had a pretty fantastic career for the past 22 years. I have to say that because there's a stigma. If you admit to having a brain tumor, people like wonder, are you smart or not? And so, you know, like I've done a bunch of stuff and uh, founded four companies and been an exec and stuff. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> But every day for the last 22 years, I take a dozen or more pills to stay alive. And there have been many times where I almost couldn't get those medications and nearly died. And so as a side effect of doing this, even though I'm a computer science and um, consumer electronics expert that's shipped billions of dollars worth of hardware on the hairy edge of what the physics could do, I also unwittingly, as a means of self-preservation, have become an expert in neuroscience, in particular neuroendocrinology. And so I was able to, I always look at this thing and I think, it's so big, it's so expensive, $50 billion of revenue in the US alone last year at $2,700 average scan cost. It's too expensive. The reason healthcare has gotten really expensive, part of it is that the technology has gotten really expensive. And so as a technologist, I felt a big obligation to try to work on bringing the cost down. So this is what we're trying to do. And the observation I had is something we've known for some time. Our, our bodies are translucent to near-infrared light. They scat Imagine going camping and inside the tent taking a flashlight and illuminating your hand. You can see the red light goes through your hand. The infrared light goes even more through your hand. It's just your eyes can't see infrared light. But your body is translucent to it. It scatters it. But even still, for decades now, people have been able to get pretty good images using optics and um, very, very fast fast detectors. And I'm going to explain just a little bit of the physics that I'm working on, because when I come out here and say I'm going to reduce the cost of something by a thousandfold and the resolution increase it by a millionfold, you think, yeah, right. So here's what really happens when that light, the infrared light, hits your hand. Imagine that block is your hand. And here's these rays of light. They're color-coded, but imagine they're all infrared. Benign near-infrared light, the type of light that you see when you wear night vision goggles. So the light goes, and this is what scattering is. Scattering is ricocheting of the light at different directions. The way you get a crisp image for, in something is to not have scattering. I wear glasses. If I took sandpaper and roughened the lens, I would see you as scattered. <laughs> and so the way you traditionally get a crisp image is, is by not scattering the light. And so traditionally, people using near-infrared light to see through the body, take the first light through. That orange ray is going at the speed of light, as is the rest of the rays in this, in this, in this block. Sorry, I'm pointing at the monitor. In this block. And that orange ray, if you can have a super fast detector, a detector at the speed of light, you can actually get a crisp image by looking at the first light through that doesn't get scattered. And people have been doing that for a while. 
And in fact, about five years ago, a group at Washington University using that principle matched the resolution of functional magnetic resonance imaging in this optical system. It's this big fiber optic wig, it weighs 50 pounds or so. It's got racks of refrigerators filled with amplifiers next to it. But I, I saw this work in a journal and I thought, wow, this is optics. That's my thing. And consumer electronics, and I know, I mean, the people at Washington University are brilliant. I met with them, I love them, but um, I know more about consumer electronics <laughs> than kind of anyone working in academia because they publish papers and I ship product. And I thought, huh, this is really cool. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so as I was thinking and dreaming about this for years, I realized the solution actually lied in holography. And I don't mean a hologram like Tupac appearing on stage in Las Vegas or even the marketing term Microsoft is using for its augmented reality thing. I mean like holography, the thing that won the Nobel Prize in the early 70s, which allows you to record both the intensity of light and the phase of light. And by phase, I mean light's a wave. It goes up and, up and down like ocean waves, just with a smaller wavelength. And this is a hologram of an object, but what if I made a hologram of the scattering of your body and then use this other property of holography called phase conjugation, invert that hologram, and then I can just basically make your body or the wall or anything transparent. And the key to be able to make holograms is to have small pixels. So my last job, I was running advanced virtual reality and augmented reality at Oculus and Facebook. And prior to that, I was running advanced consumer electronics at Google and was responsible for a lot of the advanced screen technology. So when you think about the ability to see through your body and what's happening in the trillion dollar manufacturing supply chain in Asia that makes the LCDs and OLEDs in our smartphones, there's one thing, the pixels are getting smaller. That's the Moore's law for for screens. The pixels on your smartphones are already one micron, which, by the way, is the wavelength of near-infrared light about. So we can record a hologram using really inexpensive camera chips, but we can't display it back without smaller pixels, but those smaller pixels are now being pushed with manufacturing process improvements that have been put in place for next-generation high-fidelity virtual reality and augmented reality. And so bizarrely, I, really, I thought this was far more important as we talk about the implications of being able to see inside your body in high res. So I also have a, a lot of experience in holography. I made my first hologram when I was 18. And I, I knew what I was going to do for the rest of my life or thought. Um, unfortunately, it was hard to get health insurance and a job in it. But as a grad student at MIT with a team of grad students, we built the world's first holographic video system with one micron pixels in 1989. Now, this hasn't shipped. This is a bit of the diagram. But you know, it, we were computing in real time the holographic interference pattern of, of the phase of the light. It's an interference pattern. Holography, by interference, I mean you see the wave nature of light. Um, a, a metaphor for it is if I plucked a guitar string, I'd see these nodes and vibration as standing waves. And in holography, you can create these standing waves by interfering beams and then record the phase information and reconstruct the entire wavefront. Basically, all the light that reflected off of or transmitted through anything. And in fact, in taking a, a hologram of you, like we don't actually see an object. We never see an object. We only see light because our eyes are light sensitive. And so if you can reconstruct the wavefront, you reconstruct the object in 3D. So I talked about VR uh, a bit. And so what we're doing with our holographic LCDs now in the, in the, in the lab is it, we're able to use very inexpensive chips that don't go at the speed of light, but go at video rate. And we record, invert the hologram, and then are able to focus the light directly down to a single voxel of interest. And then look with a single pixel detector around the brain or body at what's 
in that point. What's really interesting is right now, in our labs, we're going through a couple inches of brain and focusing down to about a micron, which is a neuron size. That's much, much higher resolution than MRI, which gives you a cubic millimeter. In fact, it's actually a billion times higher resolution and can allow us to look at what the neurons are doing exactly, rather than using MRI, which looks at, in, in the case of functional magnetic resonance imaging, in the case of um, telepathy and uses of, of, of reading thoughts out of your mind, it's looking at blood flow. We're able to get um, very fine focus. So, the application of this technology, as you think of making your body transparent, allows you to detect breast cancer before stage three. Mammography can't for more than half of American women. You know, um, clogged arteries, colonoscopy without the procedure, <laughs> um, many things, but also um, figure out neurologically what's going on. And a, a billion people suffer from debilitating brain disease between neurodegenerative disease and mental disease. And the therapies and the, the, the um, treatments for that are, are pretty limited with, I think the last speaker talked about having that you know, episode happen while you happen to be in the hospital, while you happen to be on your yearly MRI. It's, it's, it's not likely. And it can transform healthcare for mental disease the way um, being able to do blood tests for diabetics has transformed, has transformed healthcare for diabetics. So just to be clear, we're talking about replacing the big iron multi-million dollar systems that are the most expensive rooms in hospitals with LCDs and camera chips lining the inside of a ski hat or a bandage, consumer electronic price level. And we're aiming to do that. <laughs> and the physics is really solid. And um, the experience of our team is really solid. I've shipped lots of cutting edge screens in the supply chain of Asia for about two decades since my brain tumor. So here it is, Here's we call this one, um, uh, let's see, ski cap <laughs> and bandage. We'll get better names, we don't have a marketing team yet. But um, <laughs> you know, I don't think anyone's ever made LCDs that aren't designed for the eyes. And so we're designing these LCDs that line the inside of fabric to see inside of our bodies at higher resolution than MRI. And it's heady stuff. So as impossible as this sounds, it really uses the tools of our time, which are big data, machine learning, and the trillion dollar consumer electronics manufacturing infrastructure, which is, I think, usually ignored. I speak Chinese. So as I mentioned, um, MRI uh, gives better resolution um, for detecting things like breast cancer than mammography, but it is not used for screening, not just in the United States, which is thought to have not the most efficient healthcare system in the world, but in any country in the world. Not a single country uses it because it's too expensive. People are dying. We can save them. Uh, your lifetime odds are pretty high of getting clinical depression. And as, I've been, um, as I started Open Water, I've been talking to lots of people who work in mental health. It turns out if you're clinically depressed, you don't kill yourself at rock bottom because you don't have the energy. <laughs> kill yourself. And something like 90% of people who commit suicide have some form of mental illness. You kill, them, you kill yourself when you're coming out of it in a nonlinear, erratic way. If we can understand what's happening, we can keep people safe. So, yeah, here's just some of the numbers and some of the implications. But one of the things that really inspired me to start Open Water was um, this work by Jack Gallant at, at UC Berkeley. And let me sort of set this up for you. In this study, he took grad students and postdocs and paid them something and made them lie in MRI machines for hundreds of hours watching YouTube videos while recordings of their minds were made reacting to the YouTube videos. So libraries, if you will, were made of the scan data. 
Then a new image sequence was shown called the presented clip here. The computer then, using scan data alone, guessed what it thought the grad students were looking at. And the result is pretty close. It's grainy. I saw this and I'm like, oh my gosh, we just have to up the resolution. How do we do this? Well, turns out it's what we're doing at open order, open, upping the resolution by a lot. And rather than, this is using, this used functional magnetic resonance imaging with 10 cubic millimeter voxel scans of the brain. So basically, looking at the use of oxygen in the brain, which is what fMRI studies, whether it can see whether the blood is carrying oxygen or not. And where it's carrying oxygen, where it depletes oxygen, that's where you're using oxygen in your brain. So by slicing up your brain into kind of a thousand virtual voxels, only a thousand, this was achieved. Five years ago, and this has been replicated by neuroscience groups all over the world, and um, people have done now music and words and are you paying attention or not, are you in love or not, and on and on and on. And um, still it's being done in $3 million machines that cost a million dollars a year of upkeep that are not considered that comfortable to lie in for hundreds of, hundreds of hours. So we should be able to break that open. Um, one of the, I, I did mention that we're now focusing to about a micron through, through deep scattering flesh like the brain. And what we can then see is the differential scattering of the neurons. When a pulse goes down the sheath of a neuron, the membrane roughens in a millisecond. And then it straightens back out. And so we can look at the differential scattering of the neurons as we basically make the body effectively transparent to the light through recording a hologram of the scattering of your brain, inverting the hologram, and then we can see through a very high resolution, again, with, with just video rate chips. So this is what happens when um, it scatters, when a voxel scatters. So when we're focusing down to a neuron and it's scattering, we'll see a different play of light on the detector. So we actually have to put pixels on the detector. Our earlier one didn't have any pixels, didn't need it, just looking at, you know, is there oxygen use, is there a tumor, things like that. So this um, can enable us to look at the heartbeats of neurons. So a couple years ago, when President Obama was in office, he started the White House Brain Initiative. I was still, I think, at Google doing consumer electronics. But one thing the people that um, joined that decided was to build better tools. We can't get to understand the brain and unlock how the brain works without better tools. EEG is only going to get us so far. MRI is only going to get us so far. This, I, I, we'll, we'll publish this, I, I mean, it's unheard of. No, I didn't know it was possible to, to, to actually focus to that resolution with just an LCD and a camera chip that you can make really cheaply in a fab. It's just phenomenal. So as we march forward, um, into being able to unlock how our minds work. It's very interesting. If you look at the national academies of most every developed country on the planet, they say of the top five things you can do as a technologist, reverse engineering the brain is somewhere ranked in that top five for almost every developed country. But we're not really talking about what happens when we achieve that. And one of the reasons I decided to strike out and do a startup is so that I could talk about the technology as we were developing it. Because we're, from where I sit, this thing is coming down the pike in single digit numbers of years at scale. There's other people working on things that require elective brain surgery, as I've mentioned. I had non-elective brain surgery, and I just don't see a billion people going for elective brain surgery to be able to communicate with thought alone. Um, but it's not just people. We're not the only things with brains on this planet. In fact, this, this sort of secret life of animals that we don't see shows that they have quite complex social structures, 
and yet, and are smart, and yet this octopus is never gonna get to go to school, right? And yet, they think really different. If we're talking about, we're having a, a large diversity discussion right now in Silicon Valley, and about biological, intellectual capability, um, this octopus may be able to see answers to problems we all can't. It's got neurons all over his body, he or she. But we know that rats can smell landmines and dogs can smell cancer on you. And, you know, the, the question, does your dog really love you or does it just want food, could be also important. <laughs> um, we may stop eating animals and start collaborating with them. Who knows? <laughs> Thanks. So this technology can help people like Stephen Hawking and all the people that have the same disease he has. But I think it's far beyond that. I think we're all kind of Stephen Hawking in that we can't get the full thought out of our heads. We can get what we can, how, we, how fast we can move our mouths or type our fingers is what we can get out of our brains, the rich thought that we have going on in our brains. What if we could be able to dump those thoughts, those images, those wor those, that, that music directly out of our brain and swim with our minds with each other who are, if you can learn all I know about optics and consumer electronics and I could learn all you know, and yes, we'd have filters for the sex and violence and the things, but um, you know, like if we don't want to communicate that, like which we might not want to, there's this, this, um, Thing that Peter Gabriel, who, who the rock star and um, human rights activist, who, who he called me every week for six months trying to convince me to quit Facebook uh, to work on this. And he, he's poetic in the way he's, he's a musician, right? And he writes lyrics and sings. And so he's quite poetic in describing, he thinks that time will seem so now will seem so much slower than when we're able to communicate with thought, but yet we probably have to take swimming lessons. Um, Peter named my company, it's called Open Water because he called it Open Water. We'll have to take swimming lessons for those of us that choose to share our minds more openly to learn how to be exposed with your innermost thoughts out there. Um, and learn how to trust and collaborate with the frailness of these emotions that we um, live with and, and breathe with. So, yeah, can you imagine, for example, a movie director who wakes up with a new idea for a scene, and they're going to cut a different scene that day or cut it differently, and she... Um, she actually dreams about it. She dumps her dream to the videotape, gathers her team around and said, I know we were going to do this today, but I had this idea. Could we do this as a rough cut? Like, what, the way you can communicate what we could be capable of. Or imagine, you know, we're 3D printing homes now in a day. What if you could also hook the architect's mind directly up to it so you could change like get the whole new design and new home done in a day. Things can go much, much faster. And I think we need to get ready for that. There's profound ethical and legal implications as we go through this last barrier of privacy. But to say that we, could anybody actually say, we don't want to know how our brains work. <laughs> and we don't want to low, lower, it's, it's, it's profound what we can accomplish in terms of lowering the cost of healthcare, giving ready accessibility to people, helping to cure the, the billion people with debilitating brain disease and the two billion people that suffer for it, allow faster um, integration or faster development pipeline for pharmaceuticals, and allow us to share more of our ideas with each other. But I think we need to get ready, and it's why well, I'm talking about this. I have four minutes left, if anyone has any questions. I can keep talking, but there might be some questions. Does anyone want to go? Have considered that marine mammals might already be doing some of this? Yeah, I mean, whales have language, right? We know others as well. 
um, not just marine mammals. The wolf, a, a friend of mine's writing book, a book about civilizations. Apparently there was this study of wolves in Alaska and the alpha male had lost a fight and so his four daughters were responsible for putting him out on the ice floe and picking who the next alpha male would be. Things like this are already, like we just, we don't want, really want to acknowledge that there's a lot of, I mean, bees, there's a lot of collaboration going on and culture and community in, in the animal world that I think is, is there. You can just turn on National Geo, <laughs> Nat Geo <laughs> and see it, but we, do, we somehow, we're not that clear in talking about it. Octopuses are, are super smart in the way they are able to fool <laughs> and when they're in captivity, how they get out of their cages and <laughs> steal some fish from somewhere else, get back in the cage and cover it up so that like, the, the zookeeper doesn't know where the fish went, for example. You know, they figure out that they have to cover their tracks, for example. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Sure. So the question is, have we thought much about Alzheimer's and dementia? And yes, I mean, your chances of getting it if you make it to 90 are like 50%. So a couple of things. Approved for use in Europe is infrared therapy to kill the, the plaques of Alzheimer's. There's also... Some of the research suggests that Alzheimer's might really be triggered by small vessel disease and something called the parasites, not spelled like the vermin that are small, but P-E-R-I-C-Y-T-E-S, which are like constrictors to the capillary bed. And apparently the amyloid plaques eat and, and, and make those parasites collapse to block blood flow, which is why the brain cells are dying, for example. And so what, what can, we don't, it's not, I mean, there's lots of, there's so many people working on this and there's so many different thoughts and, and it, it's one mode of thinking right now, but certainly there's infrared therapy, directed infrared therapies, and then um, on the small vessel part of this, Blood is such a huge signal in the infrared because blood is red, it's also infrared, it's why we're warm-blooded, infrared is heat. Like it's, it's, um, it, if, it's a, if it's a blood thing, we can certainly start to um, attack that. So sure, it's a huge thing. I don't Any, think you mentioned the temporal resolution of your scanner. Can you talk about that? Temporal resolution of our scanner. Um, so how fast we can scan where is that? And so that is basically dependent on um, a few things. So how long it takes to capture, the, I feel like I should put a timing diagram up, capture an image, do the inversion, and display it on the LCD. And so... And, and what, those, what those resolutions are, and then capture the thing. And so we're doing it in sub-millisecond right now, so that would be 1,000 pixels per second. But what we're driving towards is doing that in a microsecond or nanosecond as we push forward. But right now in the lab, that's what we're doing. We see no limitations as we're building custom electronics um, microsecond and nanosecond are, are in reach for the camera, uh, camera side, um, microsecond, and then also on the display side. And I'm out of time, so thank you very much. <laughs>